purposeful inclusion. Isaiah 56, verses 1 through 5. Isaiah 56, verses 1 through 5. There it is on the screen. For those in the house of God today who may not have a Bible on their lap, Isaiah 56, 1 through 5, and the word of the Lord reads today from the King James text. Thus saith the Lord, keep ye judgment and do justice, for my salvation is near to come and my righteousness to be revealed. Blessed is the man that doeth this, and the man that layeth hold on it, that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it, and keepeth his hand from doing any evil. Neither let the son of the stranger that hath joined himself to the Lord speak, saying, the Lord hath utterly separated me from his people. Neither let the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. For thus saith the Lord unto the eunuchs that keep my Sabbaths, and choose the things that please me, and take hold of my covenant. Even unto them will I give in mine house and within my walls a place and a name better than of sons and of daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that none, excuse me, that shall not be cut off. Hallelujah. <coughs> Purposeful inclusion. If you'll bow your heads with me one more moment. Father, we love you today, God, so very much. And the Word of God is so precious to our hearts. As David the psalmist penned the words, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Even today, O oh God, in my heart I celebrate the Word of God. It is part and parcel of who we are as people. It is life and breath and food and sustenance to the children of the Most High. As the Word of God at this hour would go forth, O Lord, we pray that the mighty, powerful, wonderful, inspiring anointing of the Holy Ghost would rest upon your messenger. Help me, Lord, today, for I am feeble, I am but clay and water mixed together. With the breath of life breathed into my nostrils by the Holy Ghost. Lord, I am not the creator, I am not the author, I am merely the creation today. And I am the one that you have called, a one that you have called to deliver to the people of God. A word from heaven that they might be inspired and helped. That their faith might be established and that it might grow. Anoint today, Lord, both the ear of the hearer as well as the lips of the speaker. Let every heart today, God, that hears this word have a mind to receive it, that it might bring forth fruit. For we ask it all in none other than Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. Talking about purposeful inclusion. You know, God is a God of structure and order and design. The Word of God tells us that He knows the end from the beginning. There is nothing that is capable of surprising God. There is nothing that can happen in your life. I got news for you, LGBT believer. I got news for you, heterosexual who struggles with certain issues and struggles with certain battles in your life. There is nothing in your life that surprises God. There is nothing in your life that God was not aware of before you were born. 
your being part of the LGBT community today did not come as a surprise to God. As Troy Perry, founder of MCC, said in the title of a book he wrote many years ago, uh, God knows I'm gay. Amen. God knows my situation. He knows everything there is to know about me. And the Word of God promises us through the Old Testament prophet that when God is about to do something, when the Lord is going to do something, He said, I'm about to do a new thing. He said, but before I do it, I tell you of it. Hallelujah. Part of the way that we know that God has done or is doing something is through the fact that God will inform us in advance of what He's doing. You see, this way the church is never caught by surprise. We know what God is doing. We've had prophetic words come forth in this congregation in recent months, and the Spirit of the Lord has spoken to us and told us that the abomination that is in the White House right now is no surprise to Him. It is uh, of no, uh, you know, it, it, it's not something He is not aware of. He said, but I am using this situation to tear the mask of idolatry and to tear the mask of uh, hypocrisy off of many in the church today. There is a purpose that God has in the man who occupies the White House today. It is not the purpose that the evangelicals and the fundamentalists would try to convince us uh, that the purpose is. No, that's not the purpose that they tell us it is. But God does have a purpose, amen. And he has informed this church and this body and those who participate in our church services, he has informed us of his purpose and what he is doing. And he's convinced us and he's urged us to trust him and to believe him and to know that he is doing something good and positive for the word of God promises all things work together. For our good, to them that love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose. Amen. Yes. God is not surprised. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 56, the first five verses, God speaks to a couple of uh, people within the faith, the Jewish faith. He speaks, number one, to those, He said, the the son of the stranger who has attached himself to the Lord. You might say, well, what does that mean? That means a non-Jew who has married into the faith and in so doing has converted and become part of the Jewish faith and part of the Jewish community. And he says, I don't want you to feel like you're not part of the family. You're not part of the full body. And you're not part of the full congregation. He said, no, no, I I'm not going to have that. You see, God was giving us a foretelling of the bringing in of the Gentiles to the faith. Amen. He was already giving us a little insight into the fact that one day, hallelujah, many who are not born into the Jewish family, the Jewish community, the Jewish identity, the Jewish nationality, the Jewish religion, that one day they would in fact become part of Abraham's seed and heirs to the promise. And the Apostle Paul tells us that today even the Gentile believer is an heir to the promise. Hallelujah. We are today part of the spiritual house of Israel. And this Isaiah 56 verses 1 through 5 is a foretelling of this. He says, keep my judgment and do justice for my salvation is near to come and my righteousness to be revealed. It says, 
when my salvation comes and my righteousness is revealed, there will be no strangers. Hallelujah. You'll all be part of one singular family. Then he goes on to say, as well in verse number 3, The Lord hath utterly separated from his people. Then he said, Neither let the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. For thus saith the Lord unto the eunuchs that keep my Sabbaths and choose the things that please me and take hold of my covenant. Even unto them will I give a name. Hallelujah. Will I give in mine house and within my walls a place and a name better, better, hallelujah, than of sons and of daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. You have to understand today the situation of the eunuch. According to the law of Moses in Exodus 31, 12 through 15. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbaths and shall keep. For it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that ye may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. Ye shall keep the Sabbath therefore, for it is holy unto you. Everyone, listen to this children, everyone that defileth it shall surely be put to death. We got people run around and they try to tell us that, why don't you know homosexuality is the biggest sin on the planet? There is no greater offense to God than homosexuality. And how do we know that? Well, because God said that homosexuals ought to be put to death. Well, first of all, you don't know how to read your Bible. Secondly, you don't understand the law of Moses because nowhere in the law of Moses does it say homosexuals are to be put to death. Nowhere. It says any individuals of the male gender, doesn't say a word in the world about females, says men who are caught in the act, and I'm going to spit it out real plain and simple so nobody misunderstands what I'm saying, of anal intercourse by two or three witnesses. That is the only act that the law prohibited. Got news for you, honey. A gay men can do a whole lot more things than that one act. That's not the only thing they can do. Okay? And there was a reason for this. And if you study Jewish scholars and you study the uh, rabbis, which I have done, you find that uh, there were specific prohibitions. There was prohibitions regarding, again, I'm going to talk plain because I don't want anybody not to understand me today. There were prohibitions concerning masturbation. Uh, there were prohibitions about withdrawing prior to completing the sex act. And the reason for these prohibitions was Israel was a fledgling nation. They were coming out of Egypt. They were going into the promised land. God was going to establish them as a singular nation. And it was imperative to the security of this fledgling nation. They estimate that roughly a million, a million and a half Jewish slaves came out of Egypt potentially. It was imperative if the Jews were to occupy Israel and they were to keep it. They had to grow and they had to grow fast. There's an old saying, you know, there's security in numbers. And if they were to have an army that could protect the property that God had given them and promised them, they had to literally grow their nation as quickly as they possibly could. And therefore, God said, I don't want y'all to do a single thing in the universe that is not going to result in 
procreation that is not going to result in uh, babies being born because I need for the population of the Jewish people to literally just skyrocket. I need it to happen as quickly as humanly possible. And this is for your own good. And this is for your own security. But look at what God says about those that break the Sabbath. They're to be put to death. So you know what? Your argument that people who do this or people who do that or people who are this or people who are that, uh, that the Bible said they're an abomination and therefore they ought to be put to death. And that should tell you right there that it's the biggest sin on the, in the world. Uh, that argument is stupid. It is ignorant. And you only make yourself out to be the biggest fool on the planet when you use it. Because God established the Sabbath as a covenant and as a sign, listen to me children, between He and the nation of Israel. This is why as New Testament believers, the Apostle Paul said that every day is the Sabbath. There is, it is not necessary that we observe the Sabbath as New Testament believers because as New Testament believers, we now have the Spirit of God dwelling within us and as such, our relationship with God is very different than the relationship of Israel with God, than the relationship of the Jewish people with God. We have a much more intimate, much more personal relationship. And now every single day has become for the child of God a day of rest and a day of restoration. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? But if the Jewish man or woman were to break the Sabbath... The Word of God declares in the law of Moses that they were to be put to death. Ye shall keep the Sabbath therefore, for it is holy unto you. Everyone that defileth it shall surely be put to death. For whosoever doth any work therein, that soul, listen to the language, shall be cut off. From among his people. Six days may work be done, but in the seventh is the Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord. Whosoever doeth any work in the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. In the promise we read from God in Isaiah 56, 1 through 5, the Lord said, Neither let the son of the stranger that hath joined himself to the Lord speak, saying, The Lord hath utterly separated me from his people. Neither let the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. For thus saith the Lord unto the eunuchs that keep my Sabbaths, and choose the things that please me, and take hold of my covenant. Even unto them will I give in mine house and within my walls a place and a name better than of sons and of daughters. I will give them an everlasting name, listen, that shall not be cut off. And yet we read concerning the Sabbath in Exodus 31, 14, Ye shall keep the Sabbath therefore, for it is holy unto you. Everyone that defileth it shall be surely, uh, sh it surely be put to death. For wh whosoever doeth any work therein, that soul shall be, listen to the language, cut off from among his people. Yet God says concerning the eunuch, that he will give them a place in his house and within his walls. And he will give them a name better than of sons and of daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be, listened to the language, cut off. Say, well, pastor, that's all well and good, but aren't you comparing apples to oranges? Uh, no, because listen to what the word of God said concerning the eunuch. In Deuteronomy 23 and 1. Again, this is the law of Moses. He that is wounded in the stones, meaning the testicles. I know some of y'all are just so, uh, 
dainty that my using plain language may be offensive, but folks, uh, I, you know, we're at a time right now where people need to be told things plain and simple so nobody can walk away not understanding exactly what the Word of God is saying. He that is wounded in the stones, the testicles, or hath his privy member cut off, shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord. So according to the law of Moses, a eunuch, a man who had been castrated, let me read to you from a Jewish source what eunuch refers to. It refers to the act of castration, the removal of testes or ovaries. In the Hebrew Bible, the term saros, commonly rendered eunuch, occurs more than 40 times. As a rule, the Saras designated a court official who occasionally even reached the high rank of military commander, as in 2 Kings 25.19. Sarism were found serving at the courts of Egypt in Genesis 37 and verse 36. Ethiopia in Jeremiah 38 and verse 7, Persia in Esther 1 and verse 10, and even in Israel, 2 Kings 9 verse 32. Since in at least one known case, Pharaoh, Pharaoh's uh, eunuch Potiphar, the Saras was married. It is uh, in Genesis 39, 7. It is doubtful whether the term always or usually refers specifically to a eunuch rather than to a palace official in general. Whatever the exact designation of the term, listen, Judaism has always forbidden all forms of castration. Alone among the nations of antiquity, the Hebrews imposed a religious prohibition on the emasculation of men and even animals. A prohibition not found in the teachings of Buddha, Confucius, Christ, or Muhammad. The Bible directly refers to the ban on castration by excluding castrated animals from serving as sacrifices on the altar, Leviticus 22-24, a descendant of Aaron, quote, who hath his stones crushed, end quote, from the priestly service, Leviticus 21 and verse 20, and a man that is crushed or maimed in his privy parts, from entering into the assembly of the Lord, Deuteronomy 23 and 2, meaning that that person is forbidden from marrying within the Jewish community. So an individual then that is castrated is in a very difficult place because number one, castration does not mean that the entire male organ has been removed. That is one common misconception that many people seem to have. They think that a eunuch had his entire, you know, male organ removed. That's not what it means. It means that like an animal, they have been castrated, meaning that the testicles have been removed, which in turn means that that individual is now no longer capable of producing offspring. They are capable of sexual acts. They are most certainly capable of engaging in sexual practice. However, they are not capable of creating a child and reproducing. What did I say a few moments ago? The law of Moses can uh, ban many things, and the whole purpose of it was that the nation of Israel needed to grow. They needed to multiply as quickly as they possibly could. But a castrated man could not join himself to the congregation. He could not become part of the Jewish community. He could not marry into the Jewish uh, uh, nationality or the Jewish faith. And he certainly could not serve as a priest 
before the Lord. Even a castrated animal could not serve before God as a sacrifice. Well, I've got a little news for you about castration. Number one, it is irreversible. This mentality that in order for you to be saved, you've got to fix everything in your life that certain people claim is broken is asinine. Because God promised in our primary text today, Isaiah 56 verses 1 through 5, God promised that He was going to make a place for even the eunuch. Hallelujah! Even those, booby, whose body had been altered and that alteration would never change. Hallelujah! It would never be reversible. You'd never be able to fix it. You can still come into the family, God said. The day is coming when my salvation is revealed, when you will still be able to become a full and complete and eternal part of the family of God, even though You have been irreparably, irreparably altered. Oh, hallelujah. Got news for you today, LGBT believer. God understands your situation. And he understands whether or not that situation can be changed or altered. And I got news for you. Just because Franklin Graham thinks it can. Just because Bill, uh, uh, because uh, Jimmy Swagger thinks it can. Or just because Rob Parsley says that it can. How many people have gone through the torments of ex-gay programming and ex-gay camps and ex-gay pray the gay away only to wind up leaders in those movements to later, years later, come out and say, I've been living a lie. I've never changed this. People who go through these programs come out and they say, oh, I still have desires. I still feel a certain way. But they learn simply to suppress. Nothing has changed. If I might say so, they're still castrated. They still don't have testicles. They still don't have what is necessary in order to naturally do the act of procreation. They still don't have it within them. But God has never said that in order for the eunuch to come in, I will heal the eunuch. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? He never said, in order for the eunuch to come in, I will prepare the eunuch. In order for the eunuch to come in, I'm going to restore to him his testicles. Am I telling the truth today? My God have mercy. In Matthew chapter 19, verses 11 and 12, the Lord Jesus Christ said, But he said unto them, All men cannot receive this saying, save them, excuse me, save they to whom it is given. For there are some eunuchs which were so born from their mother's womb. And there are some eunuchs which were made eunuchs of men, and there be eunuchs which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He that is able to receive it, let him receive it. What is a eunuch? A eunuch is someone who has been permanently altered so that they are not capable of engaging in sexual conduct which will result in procreation. That is what a eunuch is. Jesus said some people are born this way. Well, wait a minute. By definition, isn't a eunuch somebody who has been physically altered? Isn't a eunuch by definition someone that has had a certain act of castration performed upon their body? How can someone be born a eunuch? Would someone not have to go into the mother's womb and castrate the child before he is even born in order for that child to be a eunuch? No, that's not what Jesus said. He said some people are born and they are incapable of conducting themselves sexually in a manner that will result in procreation.
He said some people are made that way of men. So there are those who are castrated physically. I got news for you. There are those who have been castrated emotionally and psychologically. There are those today who will never be able in their life to engage in a sexual relationship that will result in procreation, meaning simply with a member of the opposite gender. Why? Because they've been molested by their dad. They've been molested by a beloved family member, someone they trusted. They have been taken advantage of by a neighbor or someone in the community. Or they have been so psychologically tortured and tormented uh, by someone in their youth that their wiring, as it were, has been rewired. And I got news for you. Nowhere does God say for this person to make the kingdom of heaven, they've got to be rewired. In order for this person to make heaven, they've got to have their testicles miraculously restored. In order to make heaven, their castration somehow or another has to be reversed. That is not what the word of God promises. In our primary text today, Isaiah 56, 1 through 5, God says, I have a promise for the eunuch. I have a promise today for those. When the day of salvation comes, the eunuch will have a place in my kingdom. They will have a place in my courts. Hallelujah. That day of promise was realized in the 8th chapter of the book of Acts. Verses 26 through 38, we see redemption come. We see salvation come. As God has promised in Isaiah 56 to the eunuch, the word of the Lord reads, And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem to Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, an eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure, and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot, read Isaiah the prophet, Isaiah, mind you, then the Spirit of the Lord said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him, and heard him read the prophet Esaias, and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I, except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. The place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this? Of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Isn't it funny? Philip didn't need to preach to the eunuch that God was able to heal his body and restore his testicles. Isn't it wonderful that Philip didn't preach to the eunuch about drunkenness, about homosexuality, about prostitution, about some morality war that was going on in their nation. No, our message today remains the same. It will always be the same. Our message is Jesus. Hallelujah. And as they went on their way, they came along a certain water. And the eunuch said, the eunuch inquired, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? If this eunuch could read in Isaiah, if he had the capability of reading, 
then it means he very well could have read the passage we're using as our primary text today. It means he very well could have read in the Old Testament law that the eunuch had no place in the Jewish community and the eunuch had no place in Jewish priesthood and the eunuch had no place in the Jewish congregation. And yet, upon hearing the word, upon hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ, the eunuch comes upon water and he turns to Philip and he says to him, Here is water, what doth hinder me to be baptized? Oh, thank God Franklin Graham wasn't answering that question. Well, you need to be straight, Mr. Gay Man. You can't be baptized until you're straight. You must be straight, this lesbian woman, because you cannot be baptized until you're straight. The Word of God said, and Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down, they both, uh, excuse me, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. The New Testament message is very different than the Old Testament law. The Old Testament law prohibited the eunuch from being able to join himself to the community of the Jewish people, to the nation of Israel. The Old Testament law, the law of Moses, prevented the eunuch from serving in the priesthood. The Old Testament law prevented the eunuch from marrying into the Jewish community. But the New Testament message is one of purposeful inclusion. See, God had already promised this inclusion way back in Isaiah 56. Hallelujah. Yeah. Remember what I told you? God said, I ain't going to eat kaltavalama hasai. Woo, glory. He said, I'm not going to do nothing, but I'm going to tell you about it first. Hallelujah. That means it is purposeful. That means God, he knows what he's doing. And if he's going to tell you before he does it, he said, then I've got a purpose in saying what I'm saying. I've got a plan. I've got this thing in motion. Nothing that's going to happen is going to be a secondary thought. It is all purposeful. And God promised the son of the stranger in Isaiah 56, 1 through 5. And God promised the eunuch someone who was irreparably forever changed. And there would be no changing them back. And God promised them a place. He said, not only am I going to give you a place in my court, not only am I going to, what is he saying? He's saying, not only am I going to allow you to be a member of the community, but not only am I going to allow you to serve in my court. What does the word of God say? He's made us what? Kings and what? Priests. Oh, don't you know today a eunuch could not be a priest in the Old Testament. But I got news for you, children. A eunuch can be a priest in the New Testament. Hallelujah to God. There are people out there today, they get ticked off and they get upset because this old gay boy has the nerve to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and to preach the word of God. Uh-huh. Because a eunuch can be a priest in the New Testament. Hallelujah to God. We're not under the same rule. We're not under the same law. And furthermore, God promised that in the day of his salvation things were going to change for the stranger things were going to change for the son of the stranger things were going to change for the eunuch hallelujah oh there is nothing that could ever change the fact listen to me now children there is nothing that could ever change the fact that the son of a stranger, meaning an immigrant, someone who was not born Jewish, there is nothing that could ever make them born Jewish. But Jesus said, listen now, 
to Nicodemus, he said, except a man be born again. A spiritual operation. Except a man be born again. So you see, spiritually, we are born again. And when we are born again into the family of God, we become an heir to the promise of God. We become heirs to Abraham. Hallelujah. We become Jewish by reason of the new birth experience. We become a Jew by reason of the new birth experience. But the eunuch... There is no changing the eunuch. Philip didn't baptize the eunuch and all of a sudden he'd come out of the water with his body parts restored. He didn't come out of the water suddenly healed and able to produce children and have sexual relations with a member of the opposite sex. No, he went down a eunuch, he came up a eunuch. But he asked Philip, the preacher of the gospel, the question, having heard the message of Christ, what doth hinder me to be baptized? And the answer is simply this, nothing. Right. Nothing if you can believe. Nothing if you believe. And the eunuch said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Oh, I want to tell you today, listen to me. I want to repeat Isaiah 56 verses 4 and 5. For thus saith the Lord unto the eunuchs that keep my Sabbaths and choose the things that please me and take hold of my covenant. LGBT believer today, and anybody who watches this ministry regularly knows, I do not preach messages on LGBT things all the time. That is not something I always do, but this is what God laid on my heart for today. Listen to me, children. If you have the faith to lay hold of His covenant, don't try to lay hold of the Old Testament covenant because the Old Testament covenant excludes you. Lay hold of the New Testament, the New Covenant. Hallelujah. Jesus said during the Last Supper, this is the New Covenant. This is the covenant in my blood. Hallelujah. If you can lay hold of the covenant, you can possess the promise that God made in Isaiah 56, 1 through 5. Glory to the Lamb of God. God has purposefully provided for inclusion. There is nothing in this universe that prevents you from being included in God's plan of salvation. Lastly, this afternoon, I'm almost done. Mark 16, 15 and 16, Jesus said, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel, listen to this, to every creature, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. If you can believe and obey this gospel, you can lay hold of this covenant. And after you believe and obey this gospel, listen, this preacher ain't going to get up here and tell you you can live like a dog. I'm not going to get up here and tell you you can go out and whore around. I'm not going to get up here and tell you you can live a life of drunkenness and, uh, you know, act the fool. That is not consistent with Christian living. As a child of God, we live our lives to be a witness and a testimony to an unsaved world. Whether you're straight, gay, cross-eyed, or blind, you need to strive to live right. You're not striving to live right in order to make heaven. You're striving to live right in order to be a profitable servant. There's a difference. Because you can't earn heaven. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works. Not of your own efforts. Not of following rules. Not of obeying the law. Not of works, lest any man should boast. You can do nothing today to earn salvation. 
but we do live a life of holiness and godliness and righteousness. Righteousness meaning we try to do the right things. Amen? We purposely put our hand to good rather than to evil. If we know that it is an evil thing to hurt someone or to uh, visit pain upon someone or to kill someone or to commit adultery and to invade upon another person's marital relationship, then we don't do those things because we don't put our hand to evil deeds. Am I telling the truth now? Oh, preacher, I can't believe you're an LGBT-affirming preacher and you would say these things so plainly. Well, I'll tell you why. It's because I'm not an LGBT preacher. I'm a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the gospel of Jesus Christ just happens to be purposeful inclusion. Amen. It happens to purposely include those who are forever altered who are forever changed, who will never be able to have their circumstance and their situation reversed. But you know what? That doesn't matter to God because God says, the ball's in your court. If you can believe this and you can obey this, if you can believe and be baptized, then you have the ability to enter into the family and the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. Oh, aren't you glad today for the message of purposeful inclusion? Amen. Would you stand with me this afternoon? Glory, 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 glory.